Okay, good morning, everybody. So this is uh, January 22nd, and so a couple of announcements here, and then the people who are with me live, I'll give you a chance to to uh, ask any questions that you've got, um, and we'll kind of go from there. Um, so I want to remind everybody that we have office hour. I have office hours um, Sunday and Tuesday, 8.30 to 9.30 in the evening, and then Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday from 11 to noon. And you can make appointments at other times also. And remember, those hours or those uh, office hours are just held the exact same place here that my my uh, lecture is held. So you just show up in my WebEx room during those hours. And then if you could, if you need to make an appointment for a time outside of that, just let me know, and we'll see if we can come up with a mutually agreeable time. Uh, exam one, uh, we're beginning to already think about exam one. The window opens and is open from February the 8th through February the 13th, so that's really not very far away anymore. I will be re uh, posting a review for that exam on my Google site. You know, if you're if you've been on the Google site, which certainly all of you who are with me live and, and any of you who are watching the recorded video, vi um, videos have have already been to my Google site for the course also, but I'll be posting reviews at the bottom there on the Google site. And so the exam one review should be posted by January the 30th. Um, exams in my class are paper and pencil exams, so it's very traditional math tests, and they must be taken in a testing center that's proctored, so hopefully in a Lone Star testing center. They can be taken at any of the Lone Star testing centers. It doesn't have to be at North Harris. It could be at any of the testing centers in the Lone Star system. You just need to make sure that you have a photo ID when you check in. Um, for that test. And the way the test is going to work, if you take it wherever you take it um, in the Lone Star system, they will uh, fax me a scanned copy or they'll send me a scanned copy of the test. I'll grade it electronically. And if you want a graded copy of the test, you simply email me back uh, after the test is taken and I'll email you back a graded version of the exam your graded version of the exam, so or the graded version of your exam, I'll say it right. Um, okay, so that's exam, so we're starting to think about exam one already. WebAssign, um, most of you have signed up for WebAssign and are, are going on it. Uh, your first homework on WebAssign is due January the 30th, and that's two sections, 2.5 and 2.6. I do want to make sure that everybody knows that there is a grace period on uh, WebAssign, and that grace period uh, lasts through uh, January 24th or 25th, I believe, and uh, you don't have to pay uh, during that during that grace period. So even if you if like financial aid hasn't come through or something's going on, you can still register on WebAssign and get and get started on that and. Um, and uh, get started on the homework. You don't have to pay until January 24th and 25th. And just a little bit of a heads up in that I will be attempting um, to get that extended through WebAssign because of the weather um, delays that we had last week. So I'm hoping to have that delayed a little bit, but I have to go through WebAssign to do that. And I don't know if I can or not. So let's just, um, let's just assume right now that the grace period runs through uh, January 24th. Fourth, I think is uh, what it is. So, um, and I'll give it my best shot to get that extended a couple days. So, uh, remind almost all of you have signed up for remind, so that's great. I still have a couple that have not yet, but please sign up on remind. The instructions are on your um, syllabus on the Google site as far as how to sign up for remind, and I'll be sending out weekly updates through remind about the class and reminding you about some things and I can also send you documents that way um, and you can certainly get in touch with me as well. I'm still getting a little bit used to remind so give me a little bit of a, a leeway on there the first few days because uh, I've no, not used that service before but I'm going to uh, you know try to to keep up with it and use the features that are available through um, Remind to kind of contact you in a more efficient way than I've been able to in the past. So, And today, finally, today we will be finishing up section 2.5, which is on uh, the only thing we haven't done in 2.5 really 
in any big way is talk about the discriminant. So I want to talk about the discriminant for five or 10 minutes from the quadratic formula. And then we're going to look at section 2.6 and we're going to talk about solving other types of equations um, using various different techniques. And I've got it kind of outlined there at the bottom. So um, before we get started on all of that, do any of you have any questions that you need to ask me about? Oh, and while everybody's on here, one thing I do want to point out on WebAssign, and several students have asked me about this, on section 2.5 this comes up and it's going to come up the rest of the semester in various different places. Uh, I've had students ask me how do you enter uh, the plus or minus symbol? So like if you have 5 plus or minus the square root of 7, for example, and you're trying to, those are the solutions to a quadratic equation and you're trying to enter those, how do you um, enter those in WebAssign? And there is no plus or minus symbol there, but if you look carefully at the directions, the directions say uh, put the solutions in as a comma separated uh, list. And so what you have to do on something like that is literally enter those values, those two solutions separately. So you enter five plus the square root of seven and then comma and then five minus the square root of seven. So you enter mm -hmm. those as two separate solutions. I know several students have had uh, some questions about that. So I wanted to, while I've got a lot of you online right now, I wanted to kind of mention that to you. So, all right. Um, so any other questions that anybody's got that they want to ask about? No. A anything from anybody. Um, did you have a did you have a live lecture last Wednesday? Yes, I sure did. Okay. Uh, online okay. classes started. Um, if you got the email from the college, um, online classes are actually started on Wednesday officially. Um, and so I did lecture um, on on that day. That lecture is posted. You know, so if you missed that lecture, remember. Uh, the, the links to those lectures are at the bottom of my um, the Google site, so you can always go back and watch that video. So, okay. Antoinette, uh, I'm going to, uh, mute. if you'll mute yourself, that would be great. Just hit the mute button, and then when you're ready to, on your screen, and then when you, there you go, thank you very much, and then when you're ready to talk, and, and for several of you who are on with me right now that haven't done this, Jennifer, there you go, Mackenzie. Okay, you guys did great. Everybody did a good job there. <clears throat> All right, so anybody else have a question that they want to ask about before we get started? I'm good. Everybody else is okay? Any questions? Well, good. <laughs> no. And remember, for those of you who are new with me, uh, when I ask a question, like I just asked you a question, are there any questions? If I ask a question, I want you to answer. So if you're sitting there listening to me uh, right now and I ask you, do you have any questions? I, I, I really would like for you to respond no, uh, either by chatting with me, using the chat feature of WebEx, or just going ahead and, and chatting out no. I'd rather that you respond and that way I kind of know that everybody's with me and everybody's listening and all that kind of stuff so and uh, it just sounds more like a class when you do that so all right so uh, today let's so last time you know we talked about solving quadratic equations um, by using the quadratic formula so we use the quad uh, we we talked about the quadratic formula and there's just a little bit more I need to do with that before I finish uh, with that discussion. So this was the formula, right? The opposite of b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all divided by 2a. And what I wanted to talk about uh, in particular here was the expression that's underneath the radical. And that expression underneath the radical is given a special name. It's called the discriminant. And the discriminant's uh, values, b squared minus 4ac, 
And that discriminant actually allows you to discriminate. That's what the that's where the word comes from between different types of solutions. It allows you to set, categorize solutions to a quadratic equation. And so we want to talk about that a little bit. So um, as far as what the what that b squared minus four ac tells you. So if if b squared minus four ac that discriminant is positive. So let's say it's greater than zero. So what that would mean, let's look at an example where that might happen, just some positive number. Well, if you have, let, let's say, negative two plus or minus the square root of 10 over three, like that, right? The, what's the discriminant in that case? Um, the discriminant in that problem, or that little number there is 10. Right, because that's the number underneath the radical. Right, the b squared minus 4ac just represents the number underneath the radical, and so it's positive there. And what you have are two real solutions when that happens. When the when the discriminant's positive, you've got two real solutions to the equation, and that's what we're talking about here. Is it allows you to say as soon as you see that the discriminant's positive, you can say immediately that you've got two real solutions to the quadratic equation, right? So, so that's what we're talking about doing here. Um, if b squared minus 4ac is equal to 0, b squared minus 4ac is equal to 0, so for an example there, you might have, let's say, just negative 2 plus or minus the square root of 0 over 3. Well, so notice there that b squared minus 4ac is actually equal to 0, right? The number underneath the radical is, is exactly the number 0. Well, if you think about that solution right there, square root of 0 is just 0, right? And so you just end up with negative 2 plus or minus 0 over 3, or just negative 2 thirds. And so what you end up with there is you end up with just one solution. Right? And it's a real number. And so you end up with one real solution here. Now that's actually technically technically right. Technically, there's a there's an issue there, but uh, there's just one solution. Technically, it's two solutions. It just happens to be the same number. And so in some textbooks, in, instead of them writing one real solution, what you will see is a, a solution of multiplicity two or a repeated root, or a repeated solution, something like that. So you might see repeated uh, root written down. You might see uh, a root uh, or a solution of multiplicity 2 is a possibility. Multiplicity 2 just means it occurs twice. So solution of multiplicity 2. And we will actually use that terminology, multiplicity, frequently later in the course. So that's something you're going to see again. But I think probably the easiest way to say it is just that it's just got one real solution, right? That, that's all you're talking about doing. Or that's all, that's all you're talking about happening here. So what's the third possibility? You've got b squared minus 4ac is greater than 0. You've got b squared minus 4ac is equal to 0. And so what's the third possibility? Somebody? Less than zero? Yeah, right. Uh, very good. So if b squared minus 4ac is less than zero, in other words, what happens when the discriminant is negative? So as an example there, let's say you have negative uh, 3 plus or minus the square root of negative 16 over 4, just as an example. So there, the discriminant is equal to negative 16. Remember, the discriminant is the number underneath the radical. And so that would be the b squared minus 4ac. And that would be less than 0 here. And so what do you have that the discriminant's negative? Well, we know that the square root of a negative number is imaginary. The square root of negative 16 in this case is 4i. Remember that i is equal to the square root of negative 1. The square root of negative 1 is equal to i by definition, and so we have that the square root of a negative number is an imaginary number. So you end up with negative 3 plus or minus 4i over 4. And so when the discriminant is negative, you get two imaginary solutions. 
and that's the way I'm going to write it. Now, sometimes you might see it written as two complex solutions, and technically that's right, but it, it's not very descriptive about what's happening here. So I prefer to just say uh, two imaginary solutions like that. Now, what we're really doing graphically, and we're going to talk a lot more about this later in the semester in a couple of weeks, but graphically, we're talking about the difference between uh, these kinds of parabolas. Because quadratics, the graphs of quadratics are all parabolas. What we're really doing is talking about the difference between a quadratic or a parabola that crosses the x-axis twice. That is equivalent to a discriminant being positive. In other words, you have two real solutions. And then you can have a parabola that just touches the x-axis once. That's equivalent to one real solution. That's when the discriminant is equal to zero. And then finally, you could have a parabola that never touches the x-axis at all. And that's when the discriminant is negative, like that, where there's two imaginary solutions and no real solutions at all. Right, so here there's two real solutions. Here there's one real solution. And here you could say that there's zero real solutions, right? There's two imaginary solutions here, um, but zero real solutions. And so the discriminant's really kind of telling you what's happening to the graph of a quadratic when you're going through it and uh, calculating the value of that. Okay, so. Um, with all that in mind, then let's look at an example or two. Now let's see if we can categorize the solution. So that you know the directions might kind of go along those lines. Categorize uh, the solutions to these quadratics. So let's say we have a uh, two uh, x squared plus six x minus 11 equals 0. 2x squared plus 6x minus 11 equals 0. So we are not trying to solve this quadratic. All we're trying to do here is categorize what kinds of solutions this quadratic has. And so we calculate b squared minus 4ac for this equation. Um, in this case, a is 2, b is 6, and c is negative 11. So you just plug them into b squared minus 4ac. So you have 6 squared minus 4 times a, which is 2, times c, which is negative 11. And so you get 36. Um, and then notice that there's two negatives uh, through the rest of the calculation there, right? Because you're subtracting a negative. 4 times 2 is 8, times negative 11 is negative 88, but you're subtracting. So this ends up being plus 88. And you end up with 124. Now, what do you care about here? All you care about is, is the discriminant positive, right? Just going back right here, is the discriminant positive? Is the discriminant equal to zero? Or is the discriminant negative, right? That's what you're talking about doing here. And in this case, the discriminant is positive, right? This is greater than zero. And so what, do you, what would you say here? We, this equation has two real solutions. Right, that's all you're talking about doing is writing down what kinds of solutions the, uh, the equation has. So this one has two real solutions. All right, that's all you're doing. All right, let's look at another problem. Let's say we have, um, let's say, 4x squared plus x plus 5 equals 0. 4x squared plus x plus 5 equals 0. So here a is 4 b is, remember, b is the coefficient of the x term, so b is 1, and then c is 5. Okay, and so um, calculating b squared minus 4ac, you've got uh, 1 squared minus 4 times 4 times 5, and so you get 1 minus 4 times 4 is 16, times 5 is 80. And so you get negative 79. And so what do we have here? The b squared minus 4ac is equal to negative 79, which is less than 0. 
So the discriminant here is negative, and so two ways you might say this. You might say two imaginary solutions. That's one way to say it. Spell the word solution, that would be good. So let's see, solutions. Or you could also say zero real solutions. In some ways, you're saying the same thing either way, like that. Okay, and then finally, let's look at one last example, and I think you probably know how this one's going to turn out because um, this is our last case here. So let's say we have 4x squared minus 12x plus 9 equals 0. So here a is 4, b is negative 12, and c is 9. So b squared minus 4ac would be negative 12 squared minus 4 times uh, 4 times 9. And you end up with 144 minus 144. And sure enough, you get 0. So the discriminant is 0 in this case. And so in that situation, this particular equation <clears throat> has one real solution. OK, so the discriminant allows you to actually distinguish between what kinds of solutions a quadratic has. Sometimes, really, that's the only thing you're really interested in is what kinds of solutions it has, not necessarily what specifically they are. So, OK, so that's the discriminant. Anybody have any questions about that part of it, of our lecture today? No. No, I'm good. I'm good. See, that, that just sounds a heck of a lot better when you have a bunch of people saying, uh, yeah, I have a question, or no, I don't have any questions. I would just prefer that completely. So, All right, so we are moving on then to uh, other types of equations. That's our, our next stop here, and this is section 2.6. So we're going to move on beyond quadratic equations and look at other types of equations. And I'm kind of assuming that you may have a little bit of experience with some of this, but that um, some of this is there are things that you may have not seen before, possibly in another class. Quite, quite possibly that's true. All right, so first thing, let's talk about, um, and when I say other types of equations, by the way, I'm talking about non-quadratic equations. Right. So uh, I'm assuming you know how to solve linear equations with no problems. I'm assuming you know how to solve non or quadratic equations now with no problems. And so now we're going to look at some non-quadratic equations. First of all, with factoring. Um, now factoring uh, is a method that we or that we would use for quadratic equations, but factoring is also something we can use for non-quadratic equations sometimes. If, if the expression that you're talking about is factorable, you can do that. Uh, you can use this method. Remember, the idea with factoring is that you need two factors, two or more factors multiplied together to give zero. So we frequently just write a times b equals zero, but it can be any number of factors. It doesn't have to be just two factors. So um, let's look at an example or two where factoring could be used even though the equation is not quadratic. So let's say we've got, um, hold on here real quick. Okay. Uh, we have 3x cubed minus 6x squared minus 27x plus 54 equals zero. Right, this is definitely non-quadratic in that it is a third degree equation, right? So this is a third degree equation, sometimes called a cubic equation. And this one is, some, is an equation that we can solve by factoring the expression. And sometimes a polynomial that's got four or more terms, this one's got four terms, sometimes if you have four or more terms, you can use grouping to solve the equation. And that's what we're going to do here is we're going to use grouping to solve this equation. So you group 
Uh, oh, I'm sorry. By the way, one thing I forgot here, completely forgot here, is that there is a GCF. Always look for a GCF first. Look for a GCF. And there is a GCF here, and that's 3. You, right, you can take out a 3 out of this expression, which would leave you with x cubed minus 2x squared minus 9x uh, plus 18. So don't forget to take out a GCF before you do anything else. Now that, didn't, that doesn't do you any good here as far as solving the equation directly because the 3 is just a constant factor. You could divide both sides by 3 if you wanted to and actually make that constant factor go away. Or you could just leave it sitting out in front as a factor because you know that that 3 does not affect uh, the solutions at all because it's a constant. So it doesn't give you anything. I'm just going to leave the 3 sitting there. You could divide it both sides by 3 and get rid of it if you wanted to. Now I'm going to go ahead and factor by grouping. So I'm going to group the first two terms together and the last two terms together. Remember, that's kind of typically how you start the grouping method. And I'm going to change these parentheses to brackets so, because I'm going to have some parentheses on the inside here. And in the first group, uh, the common factor is x squared. And when you take out the x squared, you're left with x minus 2. And in the second group, the common factor is negative 9. And when you take out the negative 9, you're left with x minus 2. Right? And so uh, you can factor this, this particular um, polynomial by grouping. Because now there's a common factor of x minus 2. And you're left with x squared minus 9 when you do that. And the, the brackets are no longer necessary anymore because um, it's all multiplication. Now at this point, you could do one of two things. You could continue to factor this, because the x squared minus 9 factors again as x plus 3 times x minus 3. So that's one way you could proceed on with the problem. Another way you could have proceeded on if you had wanted to, you could, you could say, OK, I've got it factored. I'm just going to set each factor equal to 0, like this. So either one, either one of those is a legitimate way to deal with the problem. And then what do you do? You just set each factor equal to zero, right, and solve each of those equations. And notice in this case you end up with uh, th uh, three equations. Cynthia, do you have a question? Whoops. Yes, I do. Um, can you go back and explain the part after you took off the brackets? Are you talking about from right here to right here? Yes. Okay, so uh, in, in that particular problem, or that particular factorization, and I'm going to put that in a different color at the bottom here to kind of separate it out, you've got x squared times x minus 2 minus 9 times x minus 2, right? And so notice that what you've got there is you've got a common factor in those two terms of x minus 2. Right? There's an x minus 2 that's common in both of those terms. And so you can pull that common factor out, just like you did the 3 at the very beginning of the problem. Right? You literally pull that common factor out yeah, because it's common to both of the terms. And then when you pull it out, what do you write down? You write down what you have left. And what do I have left in each of those terms? I have an x squared in the first term and a 9 in the second term. Right? And mm -hmm. so that x minus 2 times x squared minus 9, that's this expression right here that I'm highlighting. The 3 just continues to come down for the ride because it's a common factor, so you mm -hmm. have to continue to write it. And because it's all multiplication now, I don't really need the brackets anymore. You could have put the brackets in here like that if you had wanted to, but you don't need them because it's all multiplication. So, um, you know, it, you could write them or not write them. It doesn't matter. So I usually don't write in because it doesn't matter anymore. Okay. Does that make sense? I think so. I just, like, it's, um, I don't know. I got confused on that step. When you, because, when you factor, yeah. I don't know if it's been a while since you've seen factoring by grouping, but if you've got something that's, um, that where there's a common factor, so like, let's say you had 2x mm -hmm. times, um, oh, I don't know, uh, let's say 3a minus 5b plus 5y times 3a minus 5b. I'm just making something up here. 
Yeah. You see how there's a, a 3a minus 5b that's common in both of those terms, right? There's a 3a minus 5b there, and there's a 3a minus 5b there. So yes. you can take it out. It's a common factor. And using the distributive property, you can take that common factor and write it out in front as a multiplication problem. And then you just simply write down what you have left after you've taken out that common factor. And what have I got left in this case? In the first term, I've got a 2x left. And in the second term, I've got a 5y left. OK, I see it now on this one. I, th I think it was just confusing me on the other one because I missed that part. OK, OK. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right, so you're OK. All right. Um, and um, let's see. All right, I'm sorry, I had to send a quick text message or a chat message to a student there. Um, and so we've, okay, so we've got it factored that way. Now, the other way I did this notice is what you could have done is you could have just said, okay, I'm going to set each factor equal to zero right away. And that's what I'm talking about over here. And then you could have solved there to get x equals 2. And then x squared minus 9 equals 0. What you could have done is you could have added 9 to both sides and then used the square root method and get x equals plus or minus 3 that way. Either way, you're getting the same solution set. It doesn't matter which way you wrote it out. And you're getting 2, negative 3, and 3 as solutions there. All right, so um, grouping is something you need to be aware of, that sometimes you can use grouping to factor a polynomial expression, even though it's not a quadratic, and, um, and solve the equation. Imani, uh, welcome. Can you see me? Uh, just make, make sure you mute yourself when you log in, okay? Okay. Just hit the mute button. There you go. And then when you have, Imani, when you have a question, you just unmute yourself and then you can ask your question, okay? All right, so let's look at another problem. Let's say we have, so another problem where we're using factoring uh, to solve the equation, even though the equation is not quadratic. Okay, so this is a fifth degree equation right here. And uh, once again, this is factorable, right? There's a common factor in this case of, what's the common factor here? It is x cubed. Oh, it's a 2x cubed. All right, so I can take out a 2x cubed out of this expression. And when I take out 2x cubed, I'm left with x squared in the first term and 7 in the second term. All right, so I took out the common factor, and I'm left with 2x cubed times x squared minus 7 equals 0. And now this is a multiplication problem. Now, there is no other factoring you can do here directly. So you are ready to set each factor equal to 0 and then see if you can solve these two equations. So you have 2x cubed equals 0 and x squared minus 7 equals 0. And um, <clears throat> sure enough, first equation, you can divide both sides by 2, right? And you get x cubed equals 0. And with x cubed equals 0, technically you're taking the cube root of both sides of the equation, but x cubed equals 0 means x equals 0, right? So there's a solution right there, that x has got to be 0. And then the other equation, x squared minus 7 equals 0, you just add 7 to both sides and use the square root method to solve that equation. And you get x equals plus or minus, don't forget the plus or minus, uh, the square root of 7. And those are your other two solutions here. And so this equation has three distinct solutions, 0 and positive and negative square root of 7. Right, and those are the solutions to that equation. This one was a little bit easier to solve than the last one was. So, so pay attention to grouping and GCFs in particular uh, when you're trying to factor uh, an expression. And if, if you have zero on one side, remember you have to have zero on one side of the equation, and you can factor the other side, then that's an easy way to solve the equation, or it's at least a direct way to solve the equation. All right? All right, so the next... The next kind of equation that we want to look at involves using exponent properties to solve the equation. And to use uh, exponent properties, uh, one thing that... Uh,
uh, one thing that I want you to uh, uh, remember, so I'm going to have to review this a little bit. Let's, let's review what this means right here, what x to the a over b power means. You want to review what that means because you're going to need to know that in order to solve these types of equations. So what does it mean to raise something to a fractional exponent, to a, an exponent that's a fraction here? And remember, the idea is that the denominator of the exponent is the root that you're talking about, and the numerator is the power that you're talking about. This is something that you talk about a lot in intermediate algebra. So like for those of you who are with me, in intermediate algebra, we, we talked a lot about this um, when we were doing these kinds, uh, when we were looking at exponent properties. And so this is definitely something we covered in, that uh, in intermediate algebra. So for an example, if you have 27 to the 2 thirds power, that's a 3 there, a 27 to the 2 thirds power, the denominator is the root and the numerator is the power. And so what are you doing here? You're talking about taking the third root or the cube root of 27 and then raising that to the second power. Uh, you could even, if you wanted to, you can write that out as a radical if you really want to. So you could write this as the cube root of 27 to the second power, like that. And you could either take 27 and raise it to the second power first, which you don't really want to do here because that's a big number, or you can take the cube root first. Those are interchangeable processes. And so you could also do the cube root of 27 first and then square that, which is usually what we try to do. You don't have to write it out with radicals, but you can if you kind of get confused as to how this is working out. So what's the cube root of 27? Well, the cube root of 27 is 3. And so you have 3 to the second power, and then that would be equal to 9. Right, and so 27 to the 2 thirds power is equal to 9. All right, let's do one more uh, 100 to the 5 halves power. So 100 to the 5 halves, the denominator is the root, and the numerator is the power. So this is the square root or the second root of 100 raised to the fifth power. And if you want to write it as a radical, you certainly can. As a radical, this would be the square root of 100 raised to the fifth power, like this. All right, so the square root of 100, that's easy. That's 10 to the fifth power. And 10 to the fifth power, oh my gosh, I get all sorts of crazy answers there for uh, 10 to the fifth power. But that's just 10 times 10 times 10 times 10 times 10. That's just a 1 followed by 5 zeros. I get 50 as an answer and 500 as an answer, all sorts of crazy answers there. But 10 to the fifth power is 100,000, a one followed by five zeros. All right, so that's a very brief review of what it means to raise something to a fractional exponent power. And so now we can turn our attention to equations that look like this, equations where you have something raised to a fractional power, and this something, we'll just call it Bob, Bob raised to the, a fractional power is equal to a constant. And when you have an equation like that, you can use properties of exponents to actually solve this equation. And the idea here is simply to raise both sides to the reciprocal power. Because what you're trying to do is trying to get rid of that exponent. And so if you raise both sides to the reciprocal power, you're going to do that. So when I say the reciprocal power, this is what I'm talking about. If you have Bob raised to the A to the A over B power, then just raise this side to the B over A power, right? Notice it's the reciprocal power. And what's the rule for exponents? When you raise something to a power and then you raise something to a power again, like that, you multiply the exponents. And so what's A over B times B over A? Well, it's 1. And so what happens? You've gotten rid of the exponent and you've gotten Bob by itself. Right? And so you have Bob equals right there. 
Now, the, what do you have to do on the other side, though? You have to raise the other side to the b over a power also. And uh, there are some issues with doing that that we need to talk about with examples. And so we're going to, we need to look at the examples to do this. So there are some issues with that constant raised to the b over a power. So we need to talk about that in a second. So some issues here we need to discuss. So another, I'm just saying that when you take that constant and raise it to that fractional exponent, you got to worry about some things there. And so we're going to definitely deal with that. All right, so let's look at some examples. Let's dive into this and look at some equations where you're uh, raising both sides to the reciprocal power. So start off with a pretty straightforward one. Let's say we have x to the 2 thirds is equal to uh, 16. x to the 2 thirds equals 16. Right, so notice this is an equation that's set up in the form Bob raised to a fractional power equals a constant, right? This is exactly the kind of equation we're talking about. So what do you do here? You raise this side of the equation to the 3 halves power, right? That's the reciprocal power. And what happens when you do that? The two third, you, you multiply the exponents, so 2 thirds times 3 halves is 1, and you're just left with x to the first power, right? And so we would have solved for x in this case. But what do we have to do on the other side? We have to raise this side to the 3 halves also. Now this is an issue in this particular problem, and the reason why is because what are we doing? What root are we talking about taking on both sides of the equation here? We are taking the square root of both sides. Because what's the denominator? of that exponent that we're looking at there. The denominator is a 2, and that's the root. And so we're talking about taking the square root of both sides of the equation. And what do you have to remember to do when you take the square root of both sides of the equation is you have to remember to take into account the fact that there could be two solutions. And so when the root is even, you have to use uh, a plus or minus in there. So when the root is even. So it's not just for square roots, but for fourth roots and sixth roots and so on. You have to use a plus or minus there when you raise both sides to that fractional power. If it's an odd root, you don't have to worry about that. There are no real numbers that are gonna that you have to worry about as a second solution. But with even roots you have to worry about a second solution. And so you have to put a plus or minus there. And then, and then you evaluate 16 to the 3 halves, right? This is, remember, the 2 is the root, and the 3 is the power. And so the square root of uh, 16 is 4. So you have 4 to the third power, and so then that would be 64. And you get plus or minus 64. And so those are going to be the solutions uh, to this equation right here, positive 64 and negative 64. So two solutions to this equation, and remember, you can always check these, uh, and uh, never a bad thing to check these at all. And so when you have 64 raised to the two-thirds power, the question is, is that 16? Right? You remember, you're checking the equation, so you're substituting 64 in place of x. And so that's the cube root of 16 squared, and the cube root of 16 is 4, and 4 squared is 16. So check, that's, that's true. And then negative 64 to the 2 thirds equals 16. Checking that one, <coughs> excuse me, um, the cube root of negative 64 is negative 4, right? You can take the cube root of a negative number and it's a real number. And sure enough, that checks also because negative 4 squared is also 16, right? So they both check here. All right. So uh, we've solved our first equation. So let's look at another one. And please, please stop me if you have a question. All right. Uh, is that, is, are we okay? Does anybody have a question about that problem? We're going to look at a couple more examples. But I wanted to see if anybody had any questions about that one. I'm good. No. I'm good. Okay. 
All right, so it sounds like we're okay. So let's look at another problem. Let's say we have uh, x minus 3 to the 3 halves equals 8. x minus 3 to the 3 halves equals 8. All right, so once again, this equation is in the form Bob to a fractional power equals a constant. Right, that's what we're looking at here. And so we can solve this equation using this technique we've just outlined where we take both sides and what do we do? We raise them, in this case, to the two-thirds power. So I'm raising both sides of this equation to the two-thirds power. Now what root are you talking about in this problem? Talking about an odd root, right? And so in the case of an odd root, you don't worry about, there, there could be no other real number that would make this true. And so you don't have to worry about a plus or minus here. Right? Okay, so, at the top you're using 3 over 2 and then you switch it. Is that because it's a reciprocal? Yeah, that's right. And so remember, that's if you go back here, what uh, the, this is the whole deal here, is that when you're raising something to a fractional power and you're trying to solve the equation, the way to solve it is to raise both sides to the reciprocal power. So notice that's what I do here is I raise both sides yeah, to I was the reciprocal of the original exponent. Okay, so Anne Marie, you're all right? I'm all good. I was just missing a step. Sorry. Okay, no, no, you're good. You're good. All right, so uh, we raise both sides to the two thirds power, the reciprocal power. So when we multiply, whoa. When we multiply exponents here, right, 3 halves times 2 thirds is 1. So this is just x minus 3 to the first. That's what we're trying to get. We're trying to get rid of that exponent. And then on the other side of the equation, you've got uh, 8 to the 2 thirds. So the cube root of 8 is 2, and that's 2 squared. And so you end up with x minus 3 equals 4. And then just add 3 to both sides, you've, and it's an easy equation to solve. And you end up with x equals 7. And so 7 is our solution in this particular problem. It's the only real number that makes this particular equation true. And again, no problem with checking this if you wanted to check it. Right? Always a good thing to do. Is take 7. Remember, you're going to the original equation. You plug 7 in for x, and you see if it's true. Put a question mark there. So see if it's true. So 7 minus 3 is 4. You have 4 to the 3 halves equals 8. And then that's the square root of 4 cubed. Square root of 4 is 2 cubed is equal to 8, and that's true. And so it definitely checks. right? And it's the only real number that checks here. All right, one more. Let's look at one more problem. Let's say we have 2x minus 1 to the 4 thirds equals 16. So same kind of problem. You've got an expression raised to a fractional exponent equals a constant. And so uh, what are we going to do right away? We want to get rid of that exponent, right? And so we're going to get rid of it by raising both sides to the reciprocal power. So you have 2x minus 1 to the 4 thirds, and then you're raising that to the 3 fourths, right? You raise it to the reciprocal power equals 16, raise that to the 3 fourths. And then here you have to worry about, is the root you're talking about even or odd? And in this case, when I raise both sides, I'm raising both sides to the 3 fourths, the root is even, right? And if the root is even, then we have to worry about the fact that there could be a positive solution, and there, or not could be, that there will be a positive solution and a negative solution. And so what do we have to do? But to account for that, we put a plus or minus in front of the, of the constant there. So there's going to be two solutions there. So on the left side, 4 thirds times 3 fourths is 1. And so I'm just left with 2x minus 1 to the first. That's what I was trying to get. Equals plus or minus. The fourth root is 16. Well, the fourth root is 16 is 2. And then 2 to the third power is 8. And so this is plus or minus 8 right here. Right? That's the 4th root of 16, and the 4th root of 16 is 2, and then 2 to the 3rd power is equal to 8. So you have 2x minus 1 equals plus or minus 8, and now you solve this equation. So you get 2x, just add 1 to both sides, 
get 1 plus or minus 8, and then divide by 2, and you get 1 plus or minus 8 over 2. Please don't leave it like that. Remember, I want you to, since you can do the arithmetic, I want you to finish this by doing the arithmetic. So this would be 1 plus 8 over 2, and it would also be 1 minus 8 over 2. So you get 9 halves and negative 7 halves. And those would be your two solutions to this equation. 9 halves and negative 7 halves. Okay, are we okay with that one? Anybody have a question about that one? I'm okay. I'm good. I'm good too. Okay, very good, very good. So, okay, so that's uh, the second type of equation we wanted to talk about. Equations where you're using properties of exponents. And on a test, on your first exam, I will say solve this equation using properties of exponents. That's all I'll say. I won't say raise both sides to the reciprocal power or anything like that. I'll just say rate, solve this equation using properties of exponents. All right, uh, the last type of equation we want to talk about today in class um, are equations that, are, that look like quadratics. So equations that look like quadratics. Now, what you'll frequently see in a textbook is you'll see uh, this described as equations that are quadratic in form. Quadratic in form. So quadratic in form kind of means this. So here's, here's the general form for a quadratic equation. AX squared plus BX plus C equals zero. An equation that's quadratic in form Instead of ax squared plus bx plus c, we have a times something squared, and it's more complicated than the x, plus b times that exact same something plus c equals zero. So that expression in there is some maybe more complicated expression than x. So I might say a times bob squared plus b times bob. Notice that it has to be exactly the same expression in both of them in order for it to be quadratic in form, and that's because in the original quadratic equation, you had x's in both, in both uh, terms. So it has to be exactly the same expression. Uh, and then plus a constant equals zero. And so an equation that's quadratic in form like that, if it is quadratic in form, can be actually turned into a quadratic equation. So you can turn, literally, literally turn uh, this into a quadratic by making this substitution. Whenever you see a, a bob, that expression, substitute some letter in place of bob. Now I usually use the letter A when I do the substitution, sometimes you'll see the letter U used frequently. Calculus students frequently use the letter U for a substitution. You can use any letter you want except the letter that's already being used in the equation. So if the equation's all got X's in it, then you can't use an X there. You know, if it's got all Y's in it, you can't use a Y. I just usually stick with an A uh, unless there's an A in the original equation. So, so, um, and Actually, I've got a constant of uh, a up there. So in this particular case, I probably shouldn't even use a. I didn't even think about that. Don't like that. So I'm going to use u here just in this uh, general form. So I'll let u be equal to bob. So every place you see a bob up there, substitute u. And notice what you get is you get a times u squared plus b times u plus c equals 0. And that's a quadratic equation. And so what you've done is you've taken a more complicated equation and actually turned it into a quadratic equation um, by making this substitution. On your exam, in your first exam, I will say solve this equation using an appropriate substitution. I'm not going to identify that it's quadratic in form. I'm just going to say use a, an appropriate substitution to solve this equation. All right, so let's look at some examples of this. Uh, definitely, definitely, students frequently have trouble with this kind of problem. And so I want to work uh, several examples here 
and make sure that you've got several problems worked out in your notes. So let's say I have t squared minus 4, quantity squared, minus 8 times t squared minus 4 plus 12 equals 0. And so do you see how uh, in this particular equation uh, you've got a, an expression that is the same in here. You've got a t squared minus 4. And so what you do is you always, you make this substitution. You let a, or whatever letter you're going to use, let a be the expression that's in the middle term. Uh, I focus on the middle term here. And you'll see why in the next example, probably. So that would be t squared minus 4. All right. And then you square both sides. Like that. So you let a be what's the expression in the middle term. And then you square both sides. And that should give you what you have in the first term, which it does. And so then you just make the substitution. So in place of t squared minus 4 squared, what's t squared minus 4 squared equal to? It's equal to a squared. So now we substitute. And so you get a squared minus 8 times t squared minus 4 is equal to a plus 12 equals 0. And what have you done here? You have, you know, the, the way I kind of term this is, you or describe this as you've actually kind of done a magic trick here because you've taken an equation that was not quadratic and poof you've turned it into a quadratic equation using this substitution right you're actually performing a little magic trick here using this substitution and you're taking an equation that was not quadratic and you're actually turning it into a quadratic equation right that equation at the bottom is is quadratic it's actually a very easy quadratic to solve because it factors really easily a minus 6 times a minus 2 equals 0. And so then you can set each factor equal to 0. And you end up with a equals 6 and a equals 2. Now the only problem is after you, you know, you've made the substitution, you turn the original equation into a quadratic, you've solved that quadratic, the only problem is that the letter you solve for, the variable you solve for here is a. But the original equation is in terms of t. And so you have to solve for t. And so now what you always have to do, and this is a, this is a step that frequently students forget to make at the end, is they, they solve for a, they get a equals 6, a equals 2, and then they stop. They go, okay, I'm done, yay. But in this case, You've got to solve for t. So now substitute back. Uh, to get t. See, so what's a equal to? Well, a is equal to t squared minus 4. So you have t squared minus 4 is equal to 6. And t squared minus uh, 2 is equal to 2. Oh, I'm sorry, not t squared minus 2, I'm sorry. Uh, t squared minus 4, I get it right. There you go, t squared minus 4 is equal to 2. And now you've got to solve both of those equations. And you hope that you can, you know, there's a method you can use to solve it. There is. You get t squared equals 10 by just adding 4 and then taking the square root, and you get t equals plus or minus the square root of 10. And on this equation, you add 4 and you get t squared equals 6, and so you get t equals plus or minus the square root of 6 using the square root method there. <clears throat> and so this equation ends up with four solutions, and the solutions are plus or minus the square root of 10 and plus or minus the square root of 6. What were the steps you took? You, you uh, identified that it might be an equation that was quadratic in form. You let a be what's in the middle term. Right? This is always the middle term, and then you square both sides of the equation, and you substitute and see if you can turn the equation into a quadratic. You solve the quadratic equation, and then once you've solved it, then you substitute back to get the original variable, and then you uh, solve for the original variable. So at the end, we finally solve for t. So uh, this is a common trick that a calculus student would use, is to take a problem that might be hard to solve, 
they change the variables by making a substitution and hope that that substitution will allow them to um, uh, solve an easier problem. Anybody have a question? Are we okay? I have a question. Mackenzie. Um, on your, the stat, sorry to take you back a little bit. No, you're on good. The, you're good. The C's that say A minus 6 times A minus 2, is that, are you taking the constant and seeing what divides that in the, to add up to the A, A? You're looking for two, remember, you're, what you're doing here is you're factoring an easy trinomial, and so you're looking for numbers that multiply to give 12, but add to give negative 8, right? And that would be negative 6 and negative 2. And don't forget, when, oh. you, when you factor a trinomial, you always check it. You look at the middle two terms, which gives you negative 6a, and the outside two terms, which is negative 2a, and those have to add to give negative 8a, right? And so you always check the inside two and the outside two and make sure that those give you that negative 8a. Okay, gotcha. Okay, all right. All right, let's, uh, and, and I, uh, Cynthia, do you have a question? Yes, I do. Okay. Can you repeat um, the type of question that we should look for on this? Remember you said, I'm not going to ask this, I'm going to ask Well, what, this. the way this is going to, the directions on the test are going to say, solve this equation using an appropriate substitution. Okay. Right. And when I start talking about a substitution, you, you know that I'm kind of indicating that this equation is an equation that's quadratic in form, right? Um, and so that's the way it's kind of kind of look. So so um, so for example, next problem. Uh, let's say you, this is our equation: is x to the fourth minus sixteen x squared plus fifteen equals zero. And so the directions would work like this: solve using an appropriate substitution. All right, so remember the steps I told you to take them. The steps are let A be what is equal to, or let A be the variable that's in the middle term, right? You're, you're focused on the middle term. And so the middle term is 16x squared, right? Negative 16x squared. So you let A be just what's the variable in that middle term. So let A be x squared, because that's the variable in the middle term. So you're always focused on the middle term on this because you're trying to make it a quadratic. So you've got to identify what the variable expression is that you're working with, and that will always be what's in the middle term. And then what do you do after you pick that substitution? You square both sides. So when I square both sides there, I get a squared equals, and this is going to be x squared squared, right? You're literally squaring both sides of the equation. And so you get a squared is equal to x to the fourth. And notice that's what's in the first term. And this is what you're focused on here is this substitution right here and this one right here, right? You're going to make you're going to substitute both of those into the original equation. And so x to the fourth, what's x to the fourth equal to? Right? x to the fourth is equal to a squared. So this would be a squared minus 16 times x squared, but x squared is equal to a plus 15 equals 0. And sure enough, what have we done? We have, we have um, changed the equation to a quadratic. Look, here's x to the fourth, and what's x to the fourth equal to? It's equal to a squared. And then uh, here is x squared, and what's x squared equal to? It's equal to a. Right, so you've made that substitution, and you've taken the original equation and changed it into a quadratic. And so then you go ahead and solve that quadratic. And Mackenzie, you were asking about this on the last problem, right? We're looking for, uh, in this case, two numbers that multiply to give 15, positive 15, but add to give negative 16, and that would be negative 1 and negative 15. Right, so this factor is a minus 15 and a minus 1. Uh, the inside two terms give you negative 15a. The outside two give you negative a. And that gives you the negative 16a that's the middle term. 
So uh, then you go ahead and solve this quadratic. This is the easy part to the problem once you've got it to this point. And then the, the point that the place that you got to not forget it to finish at is that uh, you haven't finished the problem, right? This is not finished because you have all you've done is solve for a here. You need to solve for x. So it's not finished now, solve for x. And so what you do is you go back to the original variable. Well, what's a equal to from the original statement or our original substitution, a is equal to x squared. Right, so you substitute back for x's to, and go to x's. So you get x squared equals 15 and x squared equals 1. And then you take the square root of both sides of those equations and you get plus or minus the square root of 15 and plus or minus 1. And those are my solutions to this equation. Plus or minus the square root of 15 and plus or minus 1. All right, so you've got, to, you've got to pick the substitution at the beginning. You let A be the middle term. You square both sides. You substitute all that stuff into the original equation. Right, we substitute it right here. And when we substitute here, what do we do? We are going from x's to a's. Right, uh, and actually let me say x's to a's right there. So x's to a's. And then at this point right here, we substitute again. But now what are we doing? We're going from A's to X's, right? We're going backwards. And that's what we did in this step right here. All right, uh, let's, I wanna work some more examples here. I, I definitely want you to have several of these worked out in your notes. So let's look at another problem. So we have two X to the two thirds uh, minus five X to the one third plus three equals zero. Two x to the two thirds minus five x to the one third plus three equals zero. Definitely not a quadratic equation. But if we, if we try a substitution here, we can make this work. What we do, right, is we let a be what, what's in the middle term. And what's the middle term? It's x to the one third. So we have a is x to the one third. And then you square both sides of that equation. So you a squared is equal to x to the one third squared. Remember, you square both sides. And remember, uh, x to the one third squared, you multiply the exponents, and what do you get? One third times two is two thirds. And sure enough, you get what's in the middle term. Right? And so notice that uh, x to the one third right here. That's going to be our a right there. And then uh, x to the 2 thirds is going to be equal to, that's our, our a squared right there. And so now we substitute. So this is going to be 2a squared minus 5a plus 3 equals 0. All we're doing is substituting. And I'm trying to color code this as best I can here. So that's that's my a right there. That's x to the one third. And then um, a squared is equal to x to the two thirds. So we've substituted and we've turned the equation into a quadratic. <clears throat> and now we factor this. And so you've got to be a little bit more careful is not quite as easy of a trinomial. You're still looking for that minus 5 in the middle term. And so you've got to put these factors of 3 in here. In this case, you put a minus 3 and a minus 1 in here. And if you see, that gives you negative 3a. The inside 2 and the outside 2 gives you negative 2a. And that gives you the negative 5a that you need. It. And so that's the correct factorization there. And then you set each factor equal to 0 and you get uh, a is 3 halves, and you get a is 1 when you solve. That little piece there is the easiest part to the problem.
And then you remember, you always do a second substitution. The second substitution is you go back to x's. And we know that a is equal to x to the one-third from the original statement of the problem. And so this is x to the one-third equals three-halves, and x to the one-third equals one. And then this actually goes back to what we talked about a few minutes ago. You've got a, uh, an x raised to a fractional exponent equals a constant. And so remember what you do to solve an equation like that using properties of exponents is you raise both sides to the reciprocal power. And so I'm going to raise this side to the third power because the reciprocal of one third is three over one or three. And you raise this side to the third power. And you do the same thing over here. You raise both sides to the third power. And so that would give you x equals 27 eighths, that's 3 halves cubed. And then you also get uh, 1 cubed, which is just 1. And so our solutions in this case are going to be 27 eighths and 1. All right, this, this, I'm definitely not saying this is the easy kind of problem to, to go through at all. Uh, it's definitely not. It's tricky. Uh, but you've got three good examples worked out now, and so those are... Those are th hopefully three problems to kind of help you through uh, the, the process. I think I do, if you're okay with it, I think I'm going to work one last problem because I think the more examples you have, the better. And so all these examples just a little bit different, but they all involve these substitutions. So this is our last problem of the day, definitely. You have x to the negative 2 minus 8, x to the negative 1 minus 20 equals 0. So the substitution, you let a be x to the negative 1. Then you square both sides. So you have a squared equals x to the negative 1 squared. And so that's a squared equals x to the negative 2. You multiply exponents there. And so then we substitute. So now you substitute right here. And so you're going from x's to um, a's. And so you've got a squared minus 8a minus 20 equals 0. And let me, let me go through and kind of color code that. We know that uh, x to the negative 1 is a. And so there's my substitution. There's an a in place of x to the negative 1. And then we know that uh, a squared is x to the negative 2. So here's an x to the negative 2. That's now turned into an a squared. And so that, that's my substitutions. And I've turned the equation into a quadratic. This one's not too bad. Uh, you're trying to get that middle term. You're looking for factors of negative 20 that will add to give negative 8. That's negative 10 and 2. And then you set each factor equal to 0. And you end up with a equals 10 and a equals negative 2. And then you substitute again. Go back to x's at the end. So you've got x to the negative 2 equals uh, 10. And uh, um, I'm sorry, not x to the negative 2. That would, that's not true. I'm sorry, a is x to the negative 1, so this is x to the negative 1 equals 10. That's better. And x to the negative 1 is equal to negative 2. Don't do anything different from what I did in the last problem. You just raise both sides to the reciprocal power, but the reciprocal power of negative 1 is negative 1. Negative 1 is its own reciprocal. So you raise both sides to the negative 1 throughout all of these steps right here. And so when you multiply exponents there, you're just left with x, and then don't forget a negative exponent, what that does is it turns the number into a fraction, it flips it, right, and so 10 to the negative 1 is 1 tenth, and then here you have x equals, and then this would be negative 1 half, and so my solutions to this equation are going to be 1 tenth and negative 1 half. Remember that a negative exponent um, and let's see, let's make that a little bit more general here. A negative exponent uh, turns something into a fraction like that, and then the exponent becomes positive.
All right. So um, let me assign textbook homework here. Textbook homework, remember, is for practice only. It's not graded. I do recommend that you do at least some of the textbook homework uh, and ask questions about it when you've got questions on it. Uh, this is good preparation for the exam is to do this textbook homework. Um, but it's not something that I'm, I'm, I'm certainly not requiring it because I'm not grading it, but it is something that I would recommend you do. So this is on page 139 of your book. I'm sorry, not page 139, 141 of your book. And these are problems uh, 7, 9, 13, 17, 15, 37, 39, Okay, that group of problems. It does be good review for the, for what we just talked about. So, all right, anybody have anything that they want to ask about here at the end on this last? I know this last problem I went through kind of quickly. Uh, anybody have any questions on the last couple of problems or anything else about how the class is going or anything like that? I have a question. Go for it. Um, if we're working on the home, like the practice homework stuff, uh -huh. and we have an issue, can we contact you about it, Ab ask questions? Absol or? Absolutely. Abs definitely, Mackenzie. I definitely want you to do that. Uh, and so, and so, like, if you're working on these practice problems right here, or your web assigned homework, either one, by the way, uh, if you have a question on web assigned, there's a uh, option for you to ask your instructor a question, or you can just email me or message me through WebAssign, and I'll be happy to try to answer it. Uh, and uh, on textbook homework, like these problems right here, it's exactly the same thing. If you have a question, you shoot me an email, shoot me a remind message. You've got multiple ways of getting in touch with me, and I'll be happy to, to respond. i give you an example. I had a student over the weekend who was a calculus student of mine for this semester who had a couple of questions. And uh, on textbook homework also, by the way, that wasn't graded, he said, hey, I've got some, and he sent me an email. And so I wrote up some solutions and some explanations on some of the problems just on my iPad. And I sent him over the weekend a PDF with a couple of problems worked out and some explanations on some things. So uh, definitely have no problem doing any of that. I definitely, uh, Mackenzie, good students get help when they, when they need it. So I absolutely have no problems with you doing that at all. Thank you. Oh, yeah, you're welcome. I mean, I'm glad you asked that, too, because that's something that's important to talk about. So uh, anything else anybody has got a question about? I'm good. I'm good no. Too. All right. Thank you guys very much. Uh, and then, uh, like I said, shoot me an email or a remind message. I'll be I'll happy to be happy to respond. I have office hours, what, uh, I guess, uh, tomorrow afternoon or tomorrow morning from 11 to 12 and tomorrow evening from 830 to 930. And then hopefully I'll see you again in lecture on Wednesday morning. Y'all have a great day, okay? Thank you. Have a good day. Have a good one. Thank you. Thank you.